I want uh, to welcome, you are already here, um, Edward uh, Denison, the Professor of Architecture uh, in uh, Bartlett School of Architecture and uh, uh, his team. So, Edward, the floor is yours. Vidas, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everyone for attending these sessions. Uh, we've been given strict instructions to stick to this one hour, so save yourselves for coffee in that one hour. And I've given strict instructions to all the presenters to try and keep it reasonably short in order to generate a fruitful discussion. So um, I will keep it brief. Just um, to summarize, yeah, as, as um, Vida said, I'm uh, Edward Dennison. I'm architecture, um, a professor of architecture and global modernities at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. And in discussions with Vidas over the last five years or so, we were in, uh, inspired to have a session on modern heritage and the Anthropocene. Uh, it's been a question for myself and for my colleagues here and, and with Vidas as well to think about, obviously under the theme of modern, modern modernism for the future, this question or paradox of modern heritage being the creator, the generator of the Anthropocene, and yet threatened by the consequences of that Anthropocenic phenomenon. So I'm very lucky to have a panel today. I hope we're being joined um, by Alessandro Petit and Sandy Hillal from, um, from Sweden. Uh, but we have a panel who are looking in some ways at sort of behind the scenes of what we conventionally see as modernism, whether in Kaunas or, or elsewhere, and looking more at the processes that gave rise to modernism, some of it obviously quite dark. Um, and there couldn't have been a better, I think, introduction to this theme in this session than uh, Jorge's um, presentation or keynote this morning, absolutely on topic as far as the Anthropocene is concerned, this idea that maybe modern heritage can be dust, or maybe dust is modern heritage, and it's a question that Linara specifically raises, is you know, can toxic waste be seen as cultural heritage? Um, so as I say, I'm very privileged to have um, such an esteemed range of presenters. I will introduce each one um, before they speak. Uh, so we're going to start with Linara, who is um, a professor here at Vitautas Magnus University in uh, Konus. Uh, thank you very much. Would, are you going to take the floor? Is it more comfortable here? Okay, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody, and thank you, Edward and Vidas, for inviting me to this conference and to such an interesting um, uh, session. I will talk about nuclear heritage um, in or as Anthropocene. And uh, if we talk about modern heritage in Anthropocene, nuclear heritage is one of the crucial things. Uh, as you probably know, uh, nuclear fallout uh, is considered as one of the uh, possible markers of Anthropocene, or sometimes we even talk about nuclear Anthropocene, which started with the first atomic detonations uh, um, of atomic bomb in 1945. Of course, this is unintentional and negative heritage, nuclear fallout. You may even say that it is non-heritage, but still it reflects important modern uh, human activities. Today, in the context of war in Ukraine, the concept of nuclear anthropocene, uh, this is the first war, conventional war, in a largely uh, nuclearized country. And we see how civil uh, nuclear objects becomes objects of nuclear terrorism uh, and uh, military attack. Now it seems that this concept of nuclear anthropocene seems sadly more and more possible. Other unintentional part of nuclear heritage is long-lived radioactive waste. It is a byproduct of this industry and it will be dangerous for humans and other biota hundreds of thousand years. It's interesting that toxic waste has to be well preserved 
protected and communicated to future generations, something which is very similar to the processes of traditional cultural heritage. Besides scientific and technological challenges, where and how to safely store the waste, there is an interesting cultural challenge, which is already called the problem of nuclear semiotics, uh, which asks a question how to warn beings, maybe not human beings, in a very distant future about dangerous materials. And here I show you some creative response to this uh, answer. But there is also an intentional making of nuclear cultural heritage, which is a fast growing field in many countries because of ongoing shutdown of the first generation of nuclear power plants, uh, because of its impact on local communities and these challenges related to management of toxic waste. However, what constitutes nuclear culture heritage? It is still an open question. Uh, we need to find an answer. Is it scientific innovations, uh, nuclear objects, uh, buildings, or industry-affected landscapes? Is it stories and memories of communities, different communities who worked in nuclear industry or those lives were affected by this industry? Are there uh, stories about scientific progress? Uh, are there stories about modern lifestyle? We all depend on electricity now more than ever. Are these stories of colonial exploitation? But uh, my question is, why is it important to look at this industrial legacy from a heritage perspective? I myself am interested more in how artists and cultural practitioners engage with the nuclear and create what I would call critical nuclear heritage. And uh, I give a few uh, examples. Throughout the history of the nuclear industry, it has been common practice to look for some empty, remote sites, uh, deserts, uh, to build new facilities or to conduct uh, uh, atomic tests. But as the artist Jesse Bolan uh, shows, there are not, no such places in the world. Uh, and she refers to nuclear modernity as a story of colonial exploitation, exploitation of lands, uh, people, and environment. Politics and industry itself, nuclear industry itself, most often take care of the technical and financial aspects of decommissioning. While the artists uh, reframe and I would say repoliticize nuclear uh, legacy from technical and political uh, questions, how just to safely preserve and contain waste and maybe make it disappear, just to disappear, uh, they reframe this question to social and cultural concerns, how to live with the waste, for example, for local communities how to care and engage with material remains and toxicscapes. In this theater performance, uh, uh, the workers of the Ignalina nuclear power plant, one we have in Lithuania, uh, which is going under the commissioning now, uh, the workers and residents of uh, Atomic Town share their life stories and fears and anxieties about living with waste. And I would say that this performance is about different temporalities, which is very important when we are thinking about Anthropocene. Here we see the drama, the human historical time and geological or so-called deep time meet. And these different perceptions of time may let us think about new responsibilities, alternative, distant, future-oriented responsibilities and duties. And this is my last uh, slide. Um, and um, I want to say that this and many other examples of critical engagement with the nuclear, I would say rethink modernity, first of all, as a highly contested and ambivalent uh, legacy. 
uh, usually we go beyond a uh, celebratory way of thinking about past um, uh, modernity as a progressive um, uh, um, uh, process. We usually go beyond mournful way of thinking about the uh, failed modernity. Uh, stressing the ambivalence as um, uh, the main thing. What is also important, these practices invite us to think about modern heritage as both intentional and not intentional or unintentional, as unsafe and changing, uh, one which makes us think, um, makes us stay with the trouble in the words of uh, Donna Haraway, and nevertheless to take care of. Thank you. Leonora, thank you very much um, and for keeping to time as well. I'm going to jump straight to, to Guang Yu, so we'll have all the presentations in one go and invite questions afterwards. Uh, uh, Ren Guang Yu is a, as an architect, an architectural historian, and lecturer at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Uh, her work spans um, alternative modernities in Asia and in Africa. And I think she's gonna be talking briefly about um, the Northeast part of China Manchukuo and touching on the work in Asmara in Eritrea. Guangyu, over to you. Um, I'm just waiting for the slide to come up. Do I press? Um, do I press on this? My PowerPoint is, oh, okay. So I have quite a few slides, but I'm not going to into too much details just to keep the time, but they're here for reference if anyone wants to discuss further. Um, this is a, a 1906 Japanese map of the world depicting Russia's power um, globally. And I think it's probably not much has changed. But what I really want to discuss today is on the top right corner, the, the, the strip that over the, the shoulder of the Chinaman. So that's the Manchuria, northeast of China. And the, the geopolitical dynamic between Russia, China and Japan and the anthropocentric nature of modernity. So if we were, or if one is to define heritage in a geographic term, this is my heritage. This is in the north, uh, northern Chinese cities of Harbin. And if one is to define heritage in the term of a style, then this is Chinese Baroque, which was designed by the Russians, but articulated and modified by Chinese builders. So how, how did they end up in China? And it all happened with a railway line in 1890 constructed by the Russians from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok to give the Navy, na naval fleet a port. Six years later, this railway cut through the interior of China. Two years later, it went southwards to the city of Dalian because Vladivostok freezes up in the winter and they need a warm water port. So what happened between those two stars, the two major junctions of the railway, is the very beginning of modern urban planning in China. So these were introduced by the Russian railway workers. So the town of Harbin and the town of Dalian, on the, the sites you have seen, were the very beginning of what we call a modern urban planning. But again, you know, 15 years later, all the effort of the Russians went into smoke when Russia was defeated by Japan in 1905. So historically, this is the very first time a Western nation was defeated by an Eastern nation. The Japanese took over the, the Russian railway and started to really expand in the region of this network of railway. And I just want to highlight that the South Manchuria Railway Company is an institutionalized, state-run, railway company with the sole purpose of extracting resources. So we see here Fushun, which was the largest open cut mine in the world. And this was uh, part of the South Railway Company's initiative. 
and you can see how you know the the, the energy, the, the the fossil fuels, the, the resources depicted and promoted. And the town of Fuchun, this is 1934, moved three times because the expansion of the size of the coal mine. So going back to what we heard this morning um, about this, you know, dust as a materialized um, a form of modernity that whether I was thinking this morning, whether we could see, you know, that the, the process of expansion of town in the urban spatial form can even be considered as, as a, you know, part of the modern heritage. So this network very quickly filled the whole region, expanded to such a scale. But of course, you know, what comes on these railway lines are not just, uh, you know, full of coals. What's been promoted at the same time, which we saw also in the previous discussion about, you know, Catania and modernity, is this a lifestyle and this idea that the progress that come with modern modernity, modernism. So this is the fastest train Asia in the world at the time. We always make a joke, it's probably still faster than many of the trains in England now um, in 1934. And uh, cosmopolitan places like Harbin um, looks like this. So here you have the Y Russians and, uh, you know, um, walking together in the same urban space as the Chinese, as the Japanese, who, um, who would occupy at the time. So I, I would propose this question. When you look at um, an image like this, you would ask uh, whose heritage is this? Because each of the party would would have a perspective, a lens, that this is a part of their heritage. And they are in physical structures, in architecture, in building, but, but they're also in popular cultures, in cartoon, cartoons and um, artwork. So within this um, um, Japan's imperial dream of Manchuria, I just want to highlight the city of Changchun, which uh, means new capital. So this was a city planned by Imperial Japan at a scale surpass any new urban planning happened in Europe at the time. So we talk about the canon canonical narrative, you know, what goes into a history, what gets mentioned, what gets emphasized. So this planning, you will, you will not be able to see in any history book of urban planning of the 20th century. It is partially realized, but you can see the scale and ambition that is uh, projected through these, um, just the streets and the scale of building. So I, I put a quote here that discussing um, Changchun of the time. So this is, um, you know, in, in, from the viewer's point of view as the modernism in Asia is at a scale never seen before. So I'm going to play a three minute clip here um, that um, is silent, it doesn't have sound, it, but um, it has a very accurate portrait of what, what's involved in this process of uh, modern development. How do I do this? Do I just press? Wait.
Okay. Apolo apologies. There's no nice music to go with it. So then, of course, all of this ended in 1945, which responded to the, the Norris um, talk that, for me, this picture of um, Hiroshima in 1945 encapsulate the anthropocentric nature of modernity, the speed of construction and destruction, and the progress and the ultimate consequence of this, pro this progress. So um, I just want to um, make a reference to Edward mentioned that this is uh, two decades of work that uh, working cross geographies um, between Africa and Asia. So in the work that, you know, what we have been able to identify is that there are a lot of very important parallel to draw between what's happening in Africa and in Asia. So for example, the division of a very large territories. Um, on the left is Africa, on the right is Manchuria, and also the colonial narrative that this idea that modernity brings the civilization, you know, civilizing the natives. So this is a very much a colonial rhetoric that happening in both contexts. And there's also a very direct link um, between Manchuria and the, the, this is the fascist. And uh, this picture is um, a place in Asmar, Eritrea in East Africa, is uh, what the locals call a tank cemetery. So these are tanks, these are Soviet tanks that used in the 1990 wars and the civil wars in 1990 ended in 1990 war, that, uh, 1991 that supported by the Soviets to the Ethiopians that fighting the Eritreans. So, I mean, I, I, I found that this is a very kind of a, um, urgent issue when you go to these areas. So, you know, you look at this a very large scale of these tanks of, of a history that is not just a traumatic. Um, what do we do with them? Are they heritage? What, what do we do with this heritage? And even very recently, this is two weeks ago, that one of our Ukrainian um, colleague um, sent us to this, um, about this, uh, this guy who's a, a military translator that actually experienced the Eritrean Ethiopian war. And then, you know, there's a quote here, he realized that he has become part of a complete, complex and cynical game, pumps weapons to a bloody regime. So all of these very, um, very broad contacts, the geopolitical dynamics and influences, in, in the end are connected. And I think it's in the creation of what we call as um, heritage, whether it's in a more special form or not. So um, I think Edward has already mentioned this. Um, so this is the conference in, in Butler next month. So we welcome your participation. So. I've run over time. Thank you very much, Guang Yu. Okay, next up we have um, Maxwell Mutanda, who is an architect and uh, lecturer in race and spatial justice at, uh, at the Bartlett School of Architecture um, and a colleague of mine. Uh, Maxwell knows Conus very well, having um, spent a week here over this summer working with KTU, um, colleagues over here on the summer school, and uh, he's here to present his work, um, his research uh, on extraction in Africa. Maxwell, over to you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you, Guangyu. Um, that was a really lovely set of presentations that I think will speak very well to what I'd like to also share, this idea of, of, of looking at um, the Anthropocene, understanding how we get to this global crisis uh, through another kind of global production of uh, space, uh, particularly colonialism. So I really like this um, definition from the Subcommission of Courtenay Stratigraphy that defines the Anthropocene as marked by, among other things, changes to the chemical composition of oceans, soils, and the biosphere, which are attributable to anthropogenic uh, perturbations, including colonization, agriculture, urbanization, and global warming. So soon I'll share a video uh, called Antipersonal Indoctrination as a provocation to the question of extractivism. And how do we begin to understand the role of colonialism in the Anthropocene? I think Lenaro 
uh, was very clear and, and, and it's very important to think of this idea of these markers, um, thinking of like, you know, the nuclear age. So although geographically the video deals with the so-called global south, there are no doubt parallels, as Guan Yu has uh, shown, to other parts of the world, uh, imperialism uh, in Asia or imperialism here in continental Europe. Um, and the energy and power landscapes um, that things like natural gas and its related infrastructure, such as cross-continental pipelines or railways, uh, brings with it. So um, it, is, it was really heartening earlier, as others have mentioned, to witness uh, Jorge's presentation and his research of this idea of, of dust and industrialization um, as ways to, again, see the mark of the Anthropocene uh, and this idea of this planetary project. So factories and mass production uh, in cities that, you know, people like Saskia Sassen refer to as global cities, London, Lisbon, or Paris, were and still are very much linked to the extraction of natural resources in reciprocal landscapes, whether they be colonial, post-colonial, um, or territories such as South Africa, Australia, Angola, Brazil, or the Congo. And now we'll just switch to a video. As far as I'm concerned, since we met you people 500 years ago, look at us. We've given everything. You are still taking it. It's true. I mean, where will the whole Western world be without, be without Africa? Our cocoa, our timber, our gold, our diamonds, our platinum, our whatever, everything you are is us. I am not saying it, it's a fact. And, and in, in return for all of this, what have we got? Nothing. Anti-personnel indoctrination against ourselves. If you go and cook your horrible diseases like AIDS, you say it is us. You brought us tuberculosis. We didn't have this big cough until white people came here. In exchange for, in exchange for Africa giving Europe 500 solid years of our people, I mean, not Europe, the Western world, of our human beings to work your canes, to dig your gold, to take in gold itself, diamond, I mean, you know, fish, peanuts, palm oil, everything. In exchange for that, we have got nothing. Nothing. And you know it. Nothing. And you look upon, you know, white folks look upon us like monkeys. It is true. It's in your literature. Hey, you know, some of your best thinkers have said this about us. Have you heard of the, I mean, all these Germans? Have you heard? Okay. Yes. <laughs> they said, Lord Burton, people like that, they said, we, we, we don't even have the brain of, of animals. That's what we've got from you people. But don't you think that this is over now? Over where? Is it over? Who said that AIDS came from the green monkey? Is it over? Okay, um, so I think I really enjoy this idea that um, uh, Jane Hutton speaks of, of these reciprocal landscapes and the story of the movement of materials. Um, and that's quite clear in examples that we've seen already in this panel alone. Um, that it, it spans geographies. Um, so it's, it's quite clear and accepted that human activity, or rather the geology of mankind, has a clear impact on the state of both the natural environment and that built by people. You know, current theory and practice uh, related to issues of sustainability, environmental management, or climate change mitigation are viewed in relation to a geological age which is defined by human activity, you know, the, the Anthropocene. So this idea of this new uh, geological epoch forces us to consider our species' planetary impact and to critically rethink and reframe the relationship between nature and the built environment. So in other words, the space in which we have created is now part and parcel of nature. 
This is evidenced by the omnipresence of, of plastic, heavy metals, petrochemicals, quintessential modern materials, nuclear materials uh, in the water, the soil, and the air of our planet. And so, you know, the question I, I'd like to, to bring is, you know, why does this matter? You know, what does today's ecological crisis mean with relation to the modern? You know, and it's really this idea of we don't get to the modern without getting through industrialization. We don't get to industrialization through getting through colonialism. And so it's really seeing how we link the historic and present day structural um, in, injustices like racism or, you know, apartheid spatial planning or social inequity such as women's suffrage and, and what that means now and has meant in the past to the built environment through the creation of exclusionary spatial planning or hierarchical privileges that uh, are biased towards men, in particular white heteronormative men, and how cities and the buildings across the world have been driven by this culture of consumption that is inherent in our idea of the modern. Thank you. Maxwell, thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm not sure if we have Alessandro and Sandy with us, but we certainly have, we have them with us. Fantastic. Great. Um, <laughs> Alessandro Petit and Sandy Hillel um, formed Decolonizing Architecture, D-A-A-R, and uh, they've done some outstanding work on refugee camps, um, particularly in Palestine, and their work on uh, stateless heritage as a sort of artistic response, as a uh, sort of a, um, provocative UNESCO nomination dossier is, is a really outstanding, uh, um, as I say, provocation to the whole process of UNESCO, which we were discussing yesterday in the ICOMOS panel as to what constitutes heritage and certainly modern heritage. Maxwell and I had the great pleasure of um, attending their exhibition at the Mosaic Rooms in London almost exactly a year ago. Um, so they have a... Alessandro, lovely to see you. Can you hear Good us okay? You. <laughs> um, so... Would you like to say a few words before your video, or should we go straight into the video? Just very few words, first of all, to thank you and um, apologize for everyone for not being able to be there. Um, I really enjoy now the series of presentations, and I really feel I'm, I'm missing something, especially the conversations that uh, hopefully we have now, but also maybe something that for sure will happen also during dinners and, and breakfast. Um, I just, um, we decided maybe to show you this sh very short video, which is about eight minutes, following the suggestion of trying to put something on the table, which is also uh, something that can be experienced visually. So instead of just uh, talking maybe from remote, um, and therefore, yes, I think we can just um, uh, launch the video and then uh, looking forward for the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Do refugee camps have history? This was the fundamental question at the base of the nomination of the Haitian refugee camp as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Refugee camps are established with the intention of being demolished. They are not accepted to have a history or a future. They are meant to be forgotten. The history of refugee camps is constantly erased, dismissed by states, humanitarian organizations, international agencies, and even by refugee community themselves in fear that any acknowledgement of the present undermines their right of return.
The only history, in fact, that is recognized within refugee communities is one of violence, suffering and humiliation. How then we understand the life and the culture that people built in camps, despite suffering and marginalization? The photo that you see here are part of the UNESCO dossier producing over two years of discussions with refugee communities, local residents, heritage experts and cultural producers. Members of the camp strongly expressed their fear that the nomination would change the status quo and threaten to undermine the legally recognized right of return. At the same time, many expressed their desire to see refugee history being acknowledged and attempt to bring back the right of return at the center of the political discussion. We were interested here in documenting the life, the spaces and the political structures that emerged in almost seven decades of exile. Palestinian camps are not made any more of tents, they are complex urban structure and we don't have the right vocabulary to understand and describe this forced condition of permanent temporariness. In understanding today's refugee condition beyond the humanitarian crisis, refugee heritage traces, documents, reveals and represent refugee history beyond the narrative of suffering and displacement. خلدة قطرة التينة القسطينة تل الترمس الفالوجة عراق المنشية القبيبة الدوايمة بيت جبرين بيت نتيف علار خربة التنور راس أبو عمار القبو بيت عطاب سفلة بيت محسير الشوع عسلين صرعة عرطوف دير رفات دير الهوى لفتة دير ياسين عين كارم المالحة سطاف صوبة خربة اللوز كسلة دير عبان الجورة زكريا البريج كدنا ذكرين دير الدبان دير الشيخ جرش مغلس عجور الولج These are the names of the villages of origin of which Palestinians were expelled and now reside in the Hesha refugee camp. Israel demolished more than 300 villages in 1948 in order to prevent Palestinians from returning to their homes. Today, only a few public buildings like schools, mosques and cemeteries are standing as material evidence to the expulsion of the Palestinians. Today, these villages have for the most part 
been substituted with exclusive Jewish Israeli towns, national parks, and industrial areas. Refugee camps and villages of origin are associated with the same history of displacement and disposition. They are both in legal limbo and suspended. On the one hand, the camp is a permanent temporary space of emergency carved out of the state sovereignty. While on the other hand, the village is legally defined by the Israeli state as absentee property. Despite their geographical separations, the two sites clearly have direct links and connections. Therefore, we see the possibility and the urgency of nominating the Hesha refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a serial transboundary World Heritage Site according to the UNESCO World Heritage Site criteria. That's it. Thank you. Alessandro, thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll be able to get him back on the screen so we can spend the last 15 minutes or so uh, with some questions. We've got coffee break coming up, so um, I'm conscious that if you do have any other burning questions, you can catch the uh, presenters over a coffee. For now, though, I just want to, to, to jump straight in. Um, there's so much that one, one could talk about in all of your presentations. Thank you very much for the richness of all of them and um, for raising some really fundamental questions, many of which we touched on a little in the ICOMOS panel yesterday, if anyone was able to join that, looking at the Getty's um, historical thematic framework and uh, trying to, which in itself tries to look at the 20th century through a thematic approach, so restructuring the frameworks with which we understand this heritage. One thing that came across very strongly, I think, in all of your presentations was this question of the, the definitions of modern heritage and our inability to properly define it, or nuclear heritage, or other types of heritage. Um, it seems like, uh, Alessandro, in your piece, you, you talked about not we lacking the vocabulary to deal with it. And I, it seems like, at an institutional level, of course, UNESCO lacks the capacity to acknowledge or accept your proposition, for example. So I want to put the question to Alessandro first, but then obviously to the rest of the panel, because um, I know you don't have the privilege of having a coffee with us afterwards, Alessandro. So I'll put the question uh, Thank you. for you, you to answer first about this question of definitions. And I mean, Uta this morning um, talked about a paradigm shift that we're facing at the moment in heritage practice um, and theory. Is it a time now where we really need to fundamentally think the definitions and our approaches to this question of heritage? And maybe what can you do as a practitioner? Obviously, you've done an enormous amount already. Maybe what are you working on now to keep driving that message forward? Thank you. Yeah, I guess starting also very much from um, the experience that we had and the necessity where um, confronting um, certain urban conditions um, and then understanding how much our, um, let's say, Western-based education, it doesn't provide um, the tools, it doesn't provide anything, actually is an impediment of understanding of what is just right there in front of your eyes. I mean, I'm speaking from a person that was uh, trained in, in Western academia and it took me time, you know, to uh, to challenge, you know, uh, what um, is also at the center, I guess, of your discussions, you know, how uh, modernity in a way did the very uh, fundamental uh, magic, which is somehow um, uh, organizing our understanding of the world, you know, in this very polarized conditions in which you are either modern 
or you are traditional. And, um, and of course, in that sense, modernity has been always presented as something progressive, as something you know, that people should believe in and accept, etc. cetera. Um, but however, I mean, the story that we have actually to open up and, and, and create new definitions is that, of course, it's, it's part of the story because, of course, modernity and, uh, brought so much devastations and, uh, and needs to be challenged. I mean, all these mythologies that are actually associated with modernity and, and of course, how is very much the darkened side of, of colonizations. I mean, the two cannot be separated. I mean, you cannot talk about modernism without uh, colonialism. Um, I think um, this also goes into directions in which the vocabulary that we need to build needs to recognize also that some fundamental assumptions, especially for some of us, some of us that have been trained in Western academia, needs to be challenge and that is actually extremely difficult you know because these assumptions and this criteria are are based of of uh, uh, recognizing you know heritage uh, globally but also are very much inside for example universities so in that sense that work of um, finding the vocabulary that starts from the situation that we live in is definitely a work that, uh, that needs to be done and I see that more and more that actually, actually more people are invested in that. Uh, so it seems to me really the time in which this is happening uh, more um, importantly everywhere. Thank you, Alessandro. Would anyone like to respond? Max, what, oh, did you have your hand up or is that just a hand down? <laughs> Linara, would you like to? It should be on. Oh. Yeah, it's on now. Uh, I just uh, can to continue your um, uh, words what uh, uh, we just said that uh, if you think how to define this modern heritage, uh, nuclear heritage is a part of, uh, we think and we already know in the Western academias that it is a complex heritage, that modernity is inseparable from coloni coloniality. It is two sides of one uh, coin. Um, if we think about, uh, for example, nuclear heritage, it is also not one-sided because it is uh, a nuclear science uh, energy. It's not only energy, but it's also medicine, agriculture, many, uh, many things. But nuclear industry is impossible without or was impossible without colonization and exploitation. And if we think about this uh, heritage, we all, all the time we are thinking about it. It, it is complex. But uh, today, looking at uh, uh, these two movies uh, we, we, we saw, especially on the movie from Africa, and when we hear that it was no exchange uh, between uh, colonial, colonized and colonists, for example, then it's even harder to think that it is, okay, it is complex and ambivalent, but then the question is from which position you are looking, because when it is complex and ambivalent, maybe it is some exchange possible, but in some stances we see that it is not possible because it doesn't happen. So yeah, it is a problematic heritage, difficult and dark, whatever words you use, but uh, I'm still feeling that uh, yeah, we are staying with the trouble uh, and uh, open questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, just, b just to add to that before you respond, I mean, Alessandro mentioned about it being an impediment. I like that, that idea. I, I obviously share the same experience of having a Western education and finding that is an impediment to seeing the issues that you're raising. You've both had non-Western educations up to a certain point, um, and now you're teaching in Europe. In your answers, to the original point. Um, might you just touch upon that, that point? It'd be interesting, I think, for the audience to see that from your perspective. Thank you. 
Um, I think the, the question of language is a forever problem um, for anyone who comes from a different learning or culture context. Because um, it's, it's a constant struggling to find the, the language. But I think in terms of responding to your initial question, uh, to me it is a difference between past and heritage. And we differentiate this. So there is this kind of implication that heritage, what we call as a heritage from the past, has ascribed a value. Whilst when we talk about past, we accept it is complex and it has intangible, has tangible, and it, we readily accept that it is more complicated. So I think that, you know, to me, the idea of modernism it is a concept that is our recent past, rather than the idea of a modern heritage. I think un until we are able to see heritage in the same way as we see past, that is a constellation of events and connections um, that is on the global level, whether it's geographically or in a temporal level, because um, past, you know, past cannot be past un until it's relatively, you know, um, against the now. So, you know, when you see modernity as a progress against a what came before that, you argue that mod mod modernity, that the consequence of it, where we're looking back and how we kind of suffer the consequence of that. So I think it is a perspective seeing heritage that in the way that as we see the past. That's how, you know, I feel that that language is very critical in how we interpret that. Maxwell, please. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I really appreciated also this idea that Alessandro brought up of the difference between, say, the modern or the traditional. You know, brings up ideas of the value of scientific knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems. So, I mean, I think it was important I think in Nara's presentation, highlighting the work of, was it Jesse Boylan with this kind of critical response, you know, to say the coloniality of uh, nuclear testing. You know, you think of uh, Jebel's Bleu in, in North Africa from the French, Bikini Atoll, uh, the Americans in uh, the Marshall Islands, and what you brought up of this lack of exchange you know, it's very unidirectional. And I think also with this understanding of um, our value systems and knowledge, I can't speak to a non-Western education because I was so heavily colonized. You know, we grow up singing or learning as children, Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow in a country that doesn't see snow. So it's very difficult to separate these these, these ideas. Um, it, it takes time, you have to stay in it. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a process I think that more and more people are coming to and trying to reconcile. Yeah. I'm conscious that we're close to time, but I'd like to just open it to the floor. If anyone has a question they want to share with in this forum, rather than privately over coffee, for Alessandro, any questions from the floor? Don't be shy. Or are you all just desperate for coffee? Okay, not not for now. Vidas, should we break for coffee? Is that? I I'm conscious we should stick time. I want to close just briefly by um, by mentioning going. You very modestly um, mentioned this lecture, uh, this conference that we're hosting at the Bartlett uh, at the end of October. I'd really welcome you to just Google M-O-H-O-A, MOHA, uh, Modern Heritage in the Anthropocene or Modern Heritage of Africa. It's a two-part conference. Um, the first part being last year's conference on Modern Heritage of Africa and this year's being Modern Heritage in the Anthropocene. And it's trying to do precisely what we're talking about here is that learning from um, certain geographies and certain experiences like the African experiences um, in being marginalized, in being the subject of colonization and extraction and the consequences in modern heritage terms. I mentioned yesterday in the ICOMOS panel that Europe has um, five times more cultural heritage sites than Africa, for example, and Africa only has one modern heritage site. Um, that doesn't speak to the reality of modernity in Africa, it speaks to the system with which we ascribe value to, to heritage, of course. 
So we welcome your participation, hybrid, or if you fancy coming to London um, from the 26th to 28th of October, uh, three days of panel and roundtable sessions um, on modern heritage in the Anthropocene, uh, where we'll be discussing this topic in, in a lot more detail and publishing the works of the presenters um, thereafter. The works from the Modern Heritage of Africa conference have just been published in Curator Journal, if you're interested in this. So if you just Google Curator, it's the Museum Journal, um, and there's a special edition on the uh, Modern Heritage of Africa conference in July this year. Um, and there's also a special edition on Ukraine the month before, so it's worth going to have a look. So I think with that, um, I'll thank you all for your um, very thoughtful presentations and the collation of that material. Uh, there's a lot to pack in. I know we saw the darker side of, of perhaps modern heritage, um, but it raises a lot of questions which we have the whole of the Anthropocene to deal with. Um, thank you again. And uh, Alessandro, thank you for joining us ever so much. It's, I appreciate you're under a lot of strain with the success of your work. You're in high demand, so we appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully thank we'll meet you. soon. Thank you. All. Thank you. All. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Edwards, and your team for, being, for bringing such uh, sensitive topics uh, and expanding our understanding of legacy and raising a question what we should do with this legacy.